Hey everyone, welcome to the Startup Center. My name is Ashley Torres. I am the Visual Studios Manager here at the Center. So today we're going to be going over an intro to Unity workshop. And Unity is a cross-platform game engine that allows you to create rich interactive experiences such as VR, AR, 3D, and even 2D experiences. So we're going to start off by looking at the window we have open here. So this is a Unity Hub. The Unity Hub allows you to have different versions of Unity open. So if you need an older version, you can go ahead and install that and switch to various versions. Some of the assets you'll be working with sometimes require an older version. And in order to work with those, you can install whichever version you need and whichever version is compatible. This is a very neat thing. For this workshop, we're going to use the most recent version, which is this one here. So to go ahead and get started, we're going to go back to projects and we're going to go to new and create a new workshop. And preferably you want to use a name that helps you identify whatever you're creating. So I'm going to use intro to unity. Now I already have a folder specifically for the unity projects, but you can save it to whichever folder you see fit. Okay, now that we have the project created, this is what it looks like. Now, what the main thing you want to know is that there are five main panels in the Unity interface. So there's the scene view, the hierarchy, the game view, project, and inspector. And I'm going to go through each of these main panels and show you how to use them. So first off, we're going to look at the scene view. So scene view is where you construct your game by manipulating objects in 2D or 3D. And it's navigated by several simple features. So at the moment, we only have two objects in our scene. To interact with them, you can simply click on them. To zoom in, scroll in with the mouse scroll. Or you can hit Alt and right click in and out. If you have a Mac, this would be the option command, the option button for you. Next, we want to learn how to orbit. So you can do this by holding Alt again and left click and just drag to wherever you want to orbit. So we're going to orbit around the sun. And you can also use the left mouse button. So when you're working with a lot of game objects, it can be difficult to find the game object you're looking for. So for this, there's a specific key that allows you to find anything, and it focuses on that object. So here the main camera isn't really in view. If you click the keyboard key F, it automatically puts into view, and you can just scroll in. And this is the hand tool that's used for navigating. So if you have a mouse, you can click the middle scroll button. If you don't have a mouse, this could also be here. So you can click on this here. Another way to navigate through the scene is using the WASD keys or the arrow buttons. So you can go left to right using the left and right arrow buttons and go in and out. And this will go in and out around a central focus point. If you want to change this focus point, then you simply right click the view and you can head towards that direction. Now we can focus on these buttons here. So these buttons are very important and you will be using them quite often. So the first one here is the move tool. So this allows you to move your object in any direction across these three axes. This is the rotate button, which allows you to rotate the object and any of these axes. This is the scale tool. So it allows you to increase the size. Now these aren't very good examples for a game object, so I'm going to go ahead and add a cube. I'm going to zoom in here. And again, you can use these tools to scale. And next we have this Rect tool, which is used to transform and rotate user interface objects. Now I won't go through every single one of these tools since we're not going to be using them in this tutorial, but if you're really interested in Unity and you want to explore all these tools and figure out 
how to apply them to a project that you're interested in, I very much welcome you to do so. I'm just going to go over the most common tools that you're going to use for next tutorials and we're going to move on. So the next panel we're going to look at is the game view. And the game view is where you can test out the project that you're making. So if you have any movement, you can enter the environment and move your character. If you have any animations, you can preview the animations. It's just to preview and test your project. So there's three general things you, that go into the gameplay view. So there's the gameplay testing, stats and gizmos, and resolution. So the gameplay testing revolves around these three buttons. So this is just the play button, which allows you to enter testing mode. The pause button for if you want to edit something. You can make edits while you're in the game mode, but you have to keep in mind that if you make these edits, they will not be saved. To save any edits, you have to exit the game mode. And this is just, again, maybe to troubleshoot something. You can test out different, different options while you're in the game mode just to see what works out best with your project. And if you've reached something that you like, then you can exit game mode and apply it to the actual project. And if you notice that when you press the play button, everything else is grayed out. This is to let you know that you're in game mode. So again, if you make any changes, they will not be saved. If this isn't very distinct for you and you would want a more obvious sign that you're in game mode, you can go ahead and change the color of this. Go to edit, preferences. We're gonna go to colors. And here we're gonna go to play mode tint. So I'm gonna make it a more reddish color. So, a bit, so it's a bit more obvious and that should be fine. So now let's go ahead and test it out. And now it's more obvious that we are in game mode. So again, it's edit, preferences, and colors. I'm gonna switch back just so it's not as bright and we can move on. So the next thing I mentioned was the resolution. You can set the resolution to a specific target platform and this is found in the game tab. So what I mean by platforms is if you want to develop this project on your phone, it's going to need a different resolution compared to if you want to develop this project as a web project. So the resolution is found here. These are just common resolutions and typically we're just going to use free aspect since we're not lurking to create anything right now. But you can, if you want a specific resolution, you can add one here. And again, you just adapt it to whatever interface you're going to be developing the project in. So the next thing on our list is the stats and gizmos. So the stats and gizmos are part of playtime testing. So the stats button allows you to see performance statistics based on the project. And the gizmos button allows you to display gizmos, which are a type of debugging tool. So gizmos are just a very visual way to debug and you can add these and display these with the gizmos button. So here is the stats button. And the gizmos button is, oh, actually it's in the scene view, my bad. And here is a bunch of options that help you debug. Okay, so next we have the hierarchy panel. The hierarchy panel is this panel here. And it is a complete list of every game object in the open scene. So here contains all the objects in the current scene. And you can also include a hierarchy of objects. So you can establish a parent and child relationship between the objects. The neat thing with the parent and child relationship is that let's say we create another cube. And we make this cube a child of the first cube. So let's say we make the first cube move. So whatever the parent does, the same movements will be applied to the child. So if we were to make the camera a child of our moving player, where whatever direction the player would move towards, the camera would also follow. And they also have their transform objects based on the origin of the parents. And the scaling and rotation are also based on the parent. The hierarchy panel also includes the create button and the search field. So the create button search field are located here. So here you can create anything you need. If you need audio, video, if you need a game object, you can do it through here. And if you're trying to search for something, you can type it up here. So let's say we're searching for a cube. It will show you all the cubes in the scene view. 
And if you haven't added anything in the scene view that is part of your project, then it will not appear. This only searches for objects in the scene. There's also another way to add any object. You can also right click on the hierarchy panel and it should still have a menu option here. It also includes these three other options. For example, duplicate. You can duplicate any object, but you could also do this by clicking Control D. And that also duplicates an object. So whenever you duplicate an object, it will be located in the exact same position as the object you duplicated. So the duplicate object will be here. You could just move it out of place so you can observe it better. And then here was the original object. The next thing you need to know is that for the search function, you could also search for specific types of objects. And you can do this by putting T colon. So let's say you were looking for lights. So you can search type light and all the lights on the scene will pop up. And you could also search up names like audio source and any objects with the component of, that has an audio source attached to them will also show up. And every other object in this game scene will be grayed out, as you can see here. So now we can travel towards the project panel. And the project panel is a panel that shows all the objects that you're currently working with in your entire project. It organizes them in folders, which you can expand. So to create a new folder, all you do is right click. Let me go ahead and take this off. So you can right click, create, and select folder. And since this is a empty project, we don't really have anything in our folders. But whenever, let's say you import some game objects from the asset store, they will be located here. And these game objects aren't necessarily part of the scene. For example, we can import a lot of uh, game objects, you can import a lot of assets, and it isn't until, until we drag it to the scene that they will be visible. But they're kind of just stored away for now. The last panel we're going to talk about is the inspector panel. So the inspector panel is this panel here, and it basically has all the properties of a selected object. And it allows you to adjust this object and adjust its preferences. So for, let's say, this game object cube, it has all the cube properties. It has a mesh, which allows you to see the cube. If you select the mesh, then the cube will disappear. And if we want to add uh, effects to this cube, we can select Add Component. And we can add several effects and several properties to this game object. We can add scripts, which enable the game object to do something, whatever we tell it to do. We can add physics, which could add gravity. It could It could add a collider, which collides with different objects. You could add another mesh which changes its shape and you could add a lot of audio and visual effects as well. And usually the inspector tab has this following format. So it has the name up here. So instead of cube2 we can name it, name it whatever, we can name it duplicate. And now the game object will be called duplicate. It has this static checks box, which simply allows this game object to appear in the scene. So if we uncheck this, it will no longer be visible in the scene. But as you can see here, it's still very much part of the scene. It's just you will not be able to see it when you're entering game mode. And this is very similar to the mesh renderer, except that the mesh renderer kind of makes it invisible. So you can, a player could still interact with the mesh with the object. It could still prevent it from going to a specific area. A lot of people use this to create a an invisible wall around the perimeter of the game, so players do not walk off the world that they've created. But it's very much still interactable to the player, whereas this is not. Then over here we have the tag dropdown. So tag is basically a label that you put on an object so that you can later access this label and use it when you're making a script. Let's say we tag this 
a player. So if this cube is a player, in our script we can say if the tag equals tag named player, then interact with this player. So it's very useful when we're scripting. And since this is a cube, I could create a cube tag so that I can tag all cubes in the scene. So to do this, we're going to simply add to this empty list and type cube. Now, when you add the cube to the tags list, is it, it isn't automatically going to apply to the object. You have to select it again and choose the tag. Right next to the tag drop down, we have the layer drop down. So if you're using, if you're creating a complicated project, you might have more than one layer. So to select which layer you want this object to be part of, you can go to this drop down. Then these are simply the components attached to the object. As I explained before, these are the properties attached to the object. And you can add whichever property you wish. And just for fun, I'm just going to add a random component to this. So we're going to add a lens flare. Now when you're editing objects, you're going to want to change specific fields. You can do this in three ways. You can drag your mouse over the values. So you can simply drag here. You can manually enter a number, or you can reset the fields to their original value. So the original value of these positions will be the origin. So it will be set to the origin. And an important thing to know is that the inspector is content sensitive. So let's say if we click on the light, the light will obviously have different properties and you can adjust these properties depending on the object. You can also lock the inspector while you're working on an object. Let's say you wanna click on different objects, but you don't wanna lose the inspector tab of the object you're currently working on. You can lock this using this little lock button and we will stay on the game cube duplicate while we look at other objects. So it's just a handy thing you can do with the inspector. And now that we've gone over everything, I just wanna mention a couple new things. So these are all the five panels, but there's still a lot of important features that you need to understand before working on an actual project. So one of these features is the asset store. So you don't have to create every single game object. You don't have to create all the things you need. There's a lot of free resources out there for you. And to download these free resources, you can go to Window and Asset Store. And let's say you're working on a game and you want to add a treasure chest or you want to have an environment that you don't want to build yourself. You can download all of these at the asset store and I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do that. So let's say we want a treasure chest. We can filter out all the 2D objects because we only want 3D. And we can also filter out the pricing, so we select free assets only. And with this, all the treasure chests that are free in our 3D will be available to us. Okay, and to close a window, you simply right click on the tab and close tab. Another main thing I want to talk about besides the user interface is scripting. But before we do that, we're going to go ahead and save since it's always important to save your project. So to save, you just like any other thing, um, it's control S. And there you go. And to show you the basics of scripting, I'm going to select a random cube and we're going to add a script to this cube. So you do this by going to add component scripts. Oh, my bad. New script. And for this, we're just going to name this cube. Now to edit these scripts, it's important that you have downloaded Visual Studios. So Visual Studios is linked to Unity. So whenever you create a script, whenever you go to edit script, which will be located here, Visual Studio would automatically open up and allow you to edit the script. And I'm going to go ahead and show you that again. So we're going to go to these three dots and edit script. And a neat thing about Visual Studios is that whenever you make any sort of edit on your code, you simply save it in the Visual Studio window and it will automatically apply to Unity. 
So you don't need to close the window every time you're saving a change. You can keep it open and keep making and implementing these changes. So when you first open the window, it'll look blank and that's completely fine. What you need to do is you need to open the file. So you go to file, open and file. And you're going to want to go toward, to the directory in which your project folder is saved. So this is the wrong directory. I'm going to go ahead and go to Unity and look for where my directory file is. So this is our directory. We're going to go to Assets and it should be here. Let's open this and take a look at how to use scripts in Unity. So scripting in Unity is extremely useful. This allows you to modify the behavior of the game objects and you can control the components attached to them. It also allows you to create your own components. You can modify the properties over time. You can also respond to user input with scripting. So the language that we see here is called C Sharp and C Sharp is very similar to C or C++. So if you have experience in any of those, they should uh, come pretty easily. It's very, very similar. It also supports Unity Script, which is a language designed specifically for Unity and it's modeled after JavaScript. So it's going to be very similar to JavaScript. So if you're more comfortable with JavaScript, I recommend you use Unity Script. And today we're going to use C Sharp. And if you don't have any previous programming knowledge or experience, then no worries. I'm going to break down every single part of this script and walk you through everything. So the first couple lines of code are just the libraries and the libraries allow us to access certain functions that are very helpful for our general use. And the next thing you see here is a class. And this class is a type mono behavior. And what mono behavior is, it's a built-in base class from which every Unity script derives from. So don't worry too much about this. It's just a base for every class. Then after here, we have two key functions. So Unity actually has several key functions and I'll be going over these key functions. But for right now, these are the two main ones I want to introduce to you since they are found in every new script. So here we have the start function. And the purpose of the start function is to be called whenever an object is instantiated in the scene. So this is going to only be called once at the start of the program. And again, it's very useful when you want to instantiate something like a player spawn or or maybe some sort of beginning text at the start of your program. Next, we have the update function. So for the update function, this is called before the frame is rendered and also before any animations are rendered and calculated if you're doing any sort of animations. This is great for any kind of movements that are constantly updating, any actions, responding to user input, and basically anything that needs to be handled over time during the gameplay. So just to show an example of how these work, I'm going to type in a simple line. That way you can observe the behavior of these functions and observe how to use them properly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert a type of print statement that prints at the bottom of the console. To do this, we're going to use debug log. And then just any sort of statement like works. So this should appear at the start of the game. It's going to appear at the bottom around this area in Unity. And let's go ahead and test this out. So we just save this and it should automatically apply to Unity. So here it's loading. And if we go ahead and press play, it should show up here and it works perfect. So now let's go ahead and test out the update function. So for the update function, since it continuously occurs, we don't want to put any print statements. So I will go more into depth on this in the next workshop where we can actually implement movements. And that way it'll be easier to show and see how it works. So the next functions I want to mention are very similar to the update function and they are the fixed update function and the late update function. And there's a very distinct difference between all three and they're used for different reasons. 
So the fixed update function is independent of the frame rate. So it doesn't happen every so often. It can happen multiple times per frame if the frame rate is low, and it may not be called if the frame rate is high. This kind of just depends on how intense your project is. It is possible that this will be called more than update. And this is useful for any physics related calculations like applying a force to a body and you have to apply a force at a fixed time. It shouldn't be dependent on how intense your program is, so your project is. And the late update function is called per frame. It is called typically after all other update functions. And this is really useful whenever you're doing a calculation. Uh, you want to make sure that all other dependent calculations can be called or other calculations are complete before you perform that task. So for example, if you have a third person camera following an object, you want the main object's movements to be done first and rotations to be done first before updating the camera that's following the player. So again, this is very useful if you want other things to be finished first before you call this function. Another function I want to mention is the onGUI function. So GUI are graphic user interface objects like text or something that the user can see. So this function handles all of those objects. So an example of this object would be like a button. So if you want a button to appear at a certain time or after a specific task, you can say if this task happened and enable this button and the button will be displayed. And on that note, there's two more functions I want to really go in depth on. Uh, they're very useful. It's the on enable function and on disable function. These functions, I'm going to go ahead and type them out in a second. I know I mentioned a lot, but these functions are called when an object becomes enable and active. So this is an on enable function. If an object that you've attached the script to becomes enabled, then you can perform a task, you can do a print statement, you can make something appear. And then there's the on disable function, which is the complete opposite. So when an object becomes disabled, this function is called. It could be used for any cleanup code, any, if you're example, if you're doing some sort of video game, if any animates die, you can do something with that. There's a lot of options, a lot of space for creativity. And I'm going to go ahead and show you these functions. I mentioned around four, and I'm going to show you how they're used. So I'm not going to go over these update functions just because they update every so often. And I want to go focus on simple print statements. So we're going to go ahead and look at, at the on GUI function. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a button. So what I did here is I defined an area for the button to be on. If you don't define a specific area where you want the button to go to, if you want it in the center or on a specific corner, then the default will be on the far left corner and it will not be visible to the player. So I defined an area in the middle of the screen. I was able to center the button by dividing the screen height and the screen width by two. What I'm going to do is if the button is pressed, then the debug log function will print pressed. And after you create an area, you always have to end an area. This here creates the button, so you don't need to worry about creating it before the if statement. You can just create it here. And let's go ahead and test it out. Okay, so we're going to play this. So here it is. We're going to put press me. And this bar is in the way, I apologize. But you can see here that it's pressed. So everything works perfectly. So that's an example of that function on GUI function. So we're going to move on to the on enabled function. And for these examples, I'm going to go ahead and make a reference to a game, the game object cube so that we can edit it in the script. So to do this, we're going to just include this here. And a very important thing we need to do is we make this public. So by making this public, we can actually access these variables in Unity. So I'm going to create a public game object and call this cube. Again, by making this public, we're going to be able to edit this. And this is important to make it public because we need to tell the script, use this specific cube. We have a lot of game objects. We have a lot of cubes in our Unity project. 
and we need, need to be able to tell the script use this specific one and the only way to do that is to make it public and click and drag the object to the slot. I'll go ahead and show you this later but for now we just need to create the game object to make a reference to the cube. What I want to do is I want to disable this in the beginning so we're going to go to start So here we have a lot of options. We're going to want to select set active. And we're going to set this to false. So this will deactivate the cube in the beginning. And whenever it deactivates this, the on disable will occur. And here we can actually do the same thing. Set active. set this to true and we can print something as soon as we enter the function so again this is going to deactivate the cube in the beginning then it's going to call this function print this statement activate the cube again and it's going to call this function and print this statement so let's go ahead and test it out So I clicked on the console just to expand the console so we can see if our script is going to work. And here we have the script. And just a quick mention, I ended up changing the name of the variables just because there was already a class called cube and that was my bad. But now that everything's saved, let's go back again. And perfect. So here is where we tell the script which specific game object to edit and implement these changes and ours is called duplicate so perfect let's go ahead and test this out so again it's going to be disabled first and here we see the cube indeed was disabled and the cube was enabled again it was disabled and it's going to continue to do that back and forth since we didn't put any statements telling it to stop at a specific point. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. now that we know that works, uh, those are the main functions I want to talk about. And uh, keep in mind, you can add several game objects. We can manipulate all three different cubes. But I do recommend that if there's a specific behavior for each of the game objects, you create a script for that game object. For example, in our workshop next week, we're going to be creating enemies, players, and each of those need a specific behavior. The enemy needs to be able to walk down a specific path uh, continuously until it detects the player. And the player needs to be able to interact with the enemy and either defeat it or get defeated or something along those lines. So I do recommend that you keep your scripts separate for a specific task. But again, you can add game objects. Uh, for example, you're going to need to add a player game object in the enemy script so that the script knows how to detect that player and perform an activity. And there's also a lot of useful functions, but there's just so many, I'm not going to go over them all. I can go ahead and post a PDF of useful functions and hopefully that can get you started and create some ideas for you. That is it for today. And thank you so much for coming to this workshop.